Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Friends of Salmon River annual general meeting. <laughs> I'm, I'm Susan Moore, president of the group, and um, I'm really happy to see lots of people attending tonight. Of course, we'd be slightly happier if we could actually see your shining faces in person, in a real room. However, this is really a pretty good alternative. And of course, it keeps everybody safe. And it also means that nobody has to drive to an evening meeting. So that's quite an advantage, I'd say. I second that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would also, we, tonight we respectfully acknowledge that we're on the traditional land of the Algonquin Nishnabeg and the Mohawk Haudenosaunee peoples. We offer our gratitude to those first peoples for their care and teachings about our earth and our relations. So tonight we are going to go over um, a lot of planned activities that we have upcoming. And uh, after, we, uh, after we go over those, then we will get right to Mark Boone's presentation, uh, all about water testing and how to, um, how to look after your wells, followed by a question and answer period. So what I'd like to actually do first is introduce the board members. Can we actually have the um, screenshots back up, you know, the photos of people back up just because, Stephanie, just because uh, if, um, you know, anybody that's here can actually wave and show us what they look like. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah. Great. Uh, we won't all be here because, like you might have heard in the beginning, a few, a few of our um, board members are actually joining by phone, at, especially at opposite ends of the watershed where the internet doesn't happen to be quite so good. So um, we have on the board, Joan King, who is vice president. We have Dave Johnson, who is treasurer and membership secretary. Oh, right. It's actually hard to see all the um, photos at once, isn't it? All the screens at once. But anyway, if you're, if you're there, folks, give us a wave. We have Amanda Tracy, who is our recording secretary, and the remainder of our directors, Herb Pillays, Philippe Couton, mm -hmm. Victor Hayes, Beth Watt. Hello on the phone. Sorry? Oh, I was just saying, hello, I'm here on the oh, phone. Can't, you can't see me. Yes, no, yeah, that's right, Victor. We can't see you because we know you're on your phone. Uh, Beth Wiley, Elizabeth Hugh, and Stephanie Wright. And I would like to actually give special thanks to Stephanie for hosting our Zoom meeting. Her technical expertise is so welcome in the group. And without her, to be honest, I'm not sure if we'd actually be here tonight, <laughs> at least on this Zoom meeting anyway. No problem. <laughs> right. One thing we won't be doing tonight is holding an election um, because members, the, all the current members of the board have already said that they're staying on for the upcoming year. So that makes everything very simple. However, if anyone wants to help out on a committee or has ideas or suggestions for us, we're happy to hear them. And the last slide on the presentation will um, will be, we'll have my email address on it. So you're um, welcome to email me if you have any suggestions for us. And as you might've noticed on the first slide, this AGM will be recorded. It will be posted as a YouTube link on our website so that people can listen to the, um, the session later on or share it with friends who maybe couldn't attend. If in the process of our FSR portion of the meeting, um, you have any questions for us, just go ahead and put them in the chat box at the bottom of the screen um, so that we can give you some answers on those. Okay, um, I'll go on to the president's report. And it actually will be, uh, after this meeting, it will actually be emailed to everybody who's uh, at the meeting just so that you can actually go over it. This is just a quick um, little highlight of a few things we did. I do want to point out in the shoreline restoration program, um, we are still looking for landowners for the planting program for next year. So if you have a shoreline property, especially a large one, but some small ones will still be accepted uh, and you wish to do some plantings, please contact Chloe. And there is the um, email address at the bottom. 
I will be giving a report in a minute on the intensive hog operation. Uh, there was also a letter sent to um, county roads um, asking them to do better protection of our fish and turtle habitat um, during road construction. Okay. And we do a fair bit of lobbying each year and you probably noticed with uh, emails we send out that um, we're, we're a member of Ontario Nature and we often go together with them uh, to lobby to help protect um, significant lands and waters. Um, we also did a collective letter to, in support of Quinny Conservation in January. And I'm sure you noticed if you're on our email list that we did a, I sent out a plea um, uh, just a few days ago to people um, to help us preserve the, let's say working toolkit of all our conservation authorities, which is now under threat um, with this latest budget bill that the Ontario government wishes to put through. So if you have time to phone or email your MPP about that action, um, it would be really helpful. Okay. So here's one of the fun activities we have planned for this year. Brand new, we're going to have an on online winter speaker series. And this is going to be a collaborative event with co-hosted with Friends of the Napanee River and supported by the Friends of Wilton Creek and Hastings Stewardship. So while they won't host events, they will share our um, share their membership list so that all their members can also participate in those uh, in all those series. So potentially a lot of people to watch these events. Talks again will be recorded and posted on all of our websites as YouTube videos so people can go and watch them anytime. The plan now is to have a series of events January, February, March and April, probably one each month. The first event, drought management plan, that will actually be the topic of the Friends of Napanee River AGM in January. And that will feature, um, and that will feature Mark Boone, who is the um, who's of course giving tonight's talk, and he will be um, addressing the, his the drought management plan that he put together. Um, and so everybody will, of course, be invited to that um, as well. Here, the, the uh, others on the list are other topics that we would um, that we would like to address, and in those in some of those series. So when we actually have some of the topics and speakers nailed down, and we have a schedule, uh, we will be sure and um, send that out to everybody. So if you are on our email list, then you will be invited to the series. So um, I am on the committee of the Concerned Citizens for Our Community Environments, Inc. And you, I'm sure you've seen many of the up, some of the updates that I have sent through our email list um, about the hog operation in Aaronsville. Um, obviously, very, very problematic for the Salmon River system because of potential contamination there. Um, so we are working on it and the concerned citizens did file a legal challenge against the township of Stone Mills only after we had been made many attempts to work with them on um, trying to correct errors and omissions in the site application plan and hoping that you know, we could work together on it. Um, after not much response, that didn't work. So the committee uh, CCE is asking the court to actually overturn the original decision to approve. And on uh, November 27th, so that's next, that's this week, this Friday, there is a hearing to actually schedule the court dates. So the um, so we hope soon to actually have a date for the whole proceeding to take place. Construction at the hog site is actually underway. Um, and what's also underway is the um, fundraising campaign of CCE to pay for the ongoing um, legal and other expenses that will be coming up. On the left of the screen, you can see uh, the URL for our Facebook page. If you go onto that, 
you will actually see a brand new update that just went on today, which contains much more information than what I just gave you. And a press release is just going out to the papers. So it should be in the local paper soon as well. The option is to allow me to increase the screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. nope. Steve Manders is a guy who lives in Kingston and has canoed pretty much the entire Salmon River. Um, and so he took photos all the way down the river and put together a very beautiful book, a photo tour of the Salmon River. Um, and much of it is places that are otherwise inaccessible. So unless you're in a canoe or a kayak, it's, it's hard to see these places. Um, if you, uh, you can see his book on his website, which is listed there. If you wish to have a copy, we are actually going to do a group order with um, um, of um, Friends of Salmon River so that everybody gets a, a reasonable price. If you think you would like to have one of these books, just email me. There's my email address on the screen, susan at moorepartners.ca. Let me know and I will um, put together that group order. Okay, so hi everyone. You know I am Stephanie. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just yeah. realized there's one person who I would actually like to um, acknowledge that we have in the audience, um, and that is Marg Isbester is here with us. And thank you very much for attending, Marg. She is the mayor of um, Greater Napanee uh, and also a member of Friends of the Salmon River. So I just wanted to acknowledge it's nice to have you here. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, okay, hi, Marg. <laughs> I'm uh, Stephanie. I'm also a board member. I've actually been on the board for a few years now, but this is my first AGM that I've been able to attend kind of because of the virtual format, which is nice. Um, and I just wanted to introduce you to a photo contest that we are launching for this fall and winter. So as you're out trying to be social distancing in the watershed, um, hopefully you can snap a photo and submit it to our contest. Um, it's open to anyone who would like to participate. You don't necessarily have to be residing in the watershed. Um, and there are three photo categories that you can enter into. Um, there are landscapes and waterscapes, flora and fauna, and people and activities. And there are descriptions of all of those in the contest uh, guidelines, which will be available on the website. And we will send it around in an email as well. So you can submit your photos. They can either be with just your iPhone or a professional camera. It's really open to all. Um, there are some guidelines in terms of the minimum resolution and maximum resolution we're willing to accept, um, but that's all in the submission guidelines. Uh, in terms of determining winners, there will be a public voting round where you can go to a website and vote on the photo you like best in each of the categories. Um, and that will decide who gets to go on to the judging round where three or four uh, experienced artists and photographers will be judging the photos um, and selecting a winner. There will be prizes for each of the categories valued at $50 and up um, for the first place winner in each category. And then there will also be a people's choice category. So if you get the most votes across any category, doesn't matter which one it is, uh, you will also win a prize. So there will be full contest rules and the submission guidelines and all that uh, available on the website. And again, we'll send it around over email so you can take a look there. So uh, keep an eye out as you are adventuring this winter and take some photos and maybe you can win a fun prize. So I'll pass it off to Herb now. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about how do we get uh, better access to the Salmon River because so much of it uh, runs through private land and is pretty much impossible to get at, although it looks like Steve Manders has done a pretty good job of it. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, after a lot of technical issues uh, and obstacles in our way, we finally uh, came upon uh, Adrian Van Lonen, who is an ultra light pilot, 
And uh, if you were watching the photos, there he is up in that little red thing. He calls it a trike. Uh, and he loves flying. And when I uh, approached him with the idea of a video, he was very, very excited. He says, you know, I've always wanted to do that. Uh, so he actually volunteered to make a video for us uh, of the length of the Salmon River from uh, Kennebec Lake all the way down to Shannonville, where the salmon runs into the Bay of Quinty. And uh, we presently have two full uh, videos, uh, one taken in the summer and one in the fall. We're going to put those together and add a soundtrack. And uh, uh, hopefully by, uh, by springtime, we will have uh, a full video of the entire length of the salmon. No more secrets, no more hidden spots. You'll get to see the whole thing. And, uh, and we're, we've been talking uh, actually about uh, showing this at an IMAX theater. So you can really see it in all its spectacular glory. And uh, because everyone who's been working on this project has been a volunteer. All it's cost us so far is about $320 for uh, a very, very specialized camera called a GoPro Hero 8, uh, which is now attached to the tip of the wing on Adrian's little trike up there. Uh, Adrian has been so excited about this. He's been talking about a sequel to uh, the Salmon River video, uh, he would like to fly over the headwaters. And uh, uh, so we're looking for a volunteer, somebody to sit in that trike right behind Adrian, uh, who knows the landscape up north of Seven really well and can take us through the headwaters of the Salmon River. So we're looking forward to sharing that video with you uh, come springtime. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm David Johnson. I'm your treasurer for Friends of the Salmon River. And um, this being one of our official meetings, our constitution uh, dictates that we need you. to, <laughs> excuse me? Can everybody hear me fine? Very well. Okay. Thank so, you. Okay. Um, at any rate, uh, after the presentation of the financial report, we're going to require um, acceptance or rejection of this financial report um, according to our constitution. So um, notice that uh, at the bottom of uh, the screen there that if you're on computer, um, you can see that there is a participants uh, button there. And if you click on that, um, you can see that there is a um, you can do some voting buttons there, yes or no. And because of the number of folks that we have here tonight, we're only going to ask for uh, no votes, okay? So if you do not want to accept the um, treasurer's report as is, and I certainly hope that you will, um, then you will vote. If you want to accept it, please do not vote, okay? Um, at any rate, I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt Dave, but I can hear somebody else on a phone. Uh, right, there is a bit of background noise there. So, folks, if you're um, if you're not speaking, and that would be everyone except for me at the moment, um, please put on your mute if you would. So um, this year, so I guess I'll back up just a bit. Um, our fiscal year runs from AGM to AGM, so. Uh, this covers uh, from uh, November 2019 through to tonight, uh, November 2020. And due to our famous pandemic, uh, it's been a rather quiet year, uh, both for, well, in, in terms of activity for Friends of the Salmon River. Um, so, Stephanie, should we be showing the, uh, there we go. Okay. So, um, in, uh, from November through to first part of uh, January 2020, 
um, we raised uh, oh about 700, a little over almost $720 in memberships. Uh, our annual general meeting being the time that we do, um, I guess, attract uh, most of our new members and renewals. Um, and then we also have, uh, in the last couple of years, we've been um, accepting memberships uh, through our uh, website, and that is managed through a PayPal account. And uh, you'll see there, there were $268 uh, transferred from our PayPal account to, uh, to our bank account for, for memberships. Um, I guess our, our largest expense in every year is a cost of doing business, which relates to insurance for our board of directors and, um, and uh, board of directors and, uh, sorry, our assistants. Um, so this is, I guess, to protect us from, and the membership from liability. Um, and so that's a rather uh, extensive expense there, almost $800. Um, in June of uh, this year, we, we decided to support um, the Tamworth and Aaronsville Community uh, Development Committee, which has also thrown its, um, I guess it, it, is, it is opposing the uh, intensive hog farming operation in Aaronsville as well. And uh, we decided that we would, um, we would support this group in their efforts to get the, uh, to get the application renewed or, or rewritten, if you will. Um, also another cost of doing business is uh, the cost of our website, website domain fees, another $518 there. So, um, and then one of our mandates uh, as Friends of the Salmon River for the Board of Directors and the Friends of the Salmon River is to provide education about the watershed and about the environment. And so every year we sponsor, for the last few years anyways, we've been sponsoring a student to attend Ontario Nature's Youth Summit. Now this year, the expense was a little less than usual because this, uh, this uh, event was carried on virtually. So we didn't have to pay for travel expenses and meals, et cetera. But nonetheless, um, Ontario Nature managed to, to still hold the summit, which was good to hear. And, and we were more than happy to, uh, to sponsor a student again for that. And then uh, our other great expense or our other expense for, uh, for this year of note is, um, as Herb mentioned, the purchase of the GoPro camera uh, for the watershed video. So uh, I think that was uh, money well spent. We certainly all supported that. And I think that the payoff will be when we get to see this uh, fantastic video. So I guess uh, just in summary, if you will, um, across the bottom there, um, you'll see uh, that our overall expenditures for uh, the last 12 months had been just over $2,400. Uh, we managed to uh, generate revenue through memberships, donations, and sales of $840, but nonetheless, um, we are operating at a deficit of uh, $1,569 and change. Um, I'm uh, hoping that perhaps this year we can uh, generate a few more memberships, but uh, Generally speaking, that is not uh, enough to, uh, I guess, to offset the expenses we have when you consider, um, you know, some of the uh, cost of doing business we have, like the uh, domain website and our insurance. So it's just a, a reality and uh, we're working through it. So at this time, um, we need a motion to, um, to accept or reject the uh, financial report. So if someone could do that. Motion it. Okay, thank you, Stephanie, appreciate that. And we need someone to uh, follow that up with a second. I can second that, David. Second that. Okay, we've got that. Now, if you will kindly, 
um, if you choose to reject this, um, could you kindly vote using that uh, that that option on your computer in the participants? Uh, if you're on the phone, you can also just chime in. We'll give it a 30 seconds. So sorry, David, are you looking for all in favor? And no, we opposed? thought we'd go the other way, David, just, um, you know, Good. looking at a negative yeah. option, I guess, just to. Um, Any just objections? To, yes. Speak yeah. now. So I think that's uh, that silence speaks for itself. <laughs> so um, we will consider the um, the financial report accepted. Now, membership renewal and purchase. Um, what with the uh, with COVID, of course, uh, there's not a whole lot of opportunity to get together and meet with folks, and you know perhaps um, exchange some, you know, do a financial transaction and renew our, um, our memberships or to, or to purchase new memberships. Uh, so I think the most efficient way to do it, um, if you are interested, and I certainly hope you are, to renew or to get, get a new membership is to uh, visit our website. And um, there you'll find an option to, um, you know, to make a donation or, or renew your membership. And um, the transaction is done through a uh, credit card, or if you have a PayPal account, um, you can do it that way as well. And so our membership fees remain the same at $20 for an individual membership and uh, $30 for a family membership. And the family membership allows you for two votes uh, on issues when the members are polled. For those of you who are not, um, I guess, fond or, or able to, uh, to purchase your memberships uh, in that electronic manner through our uh, website, and you'd prefer to send a check, please send me an email, uh, and I will provide for you uh, a mailing address that you can send your check to, okay? So rather than provide my mailing address here for, uh, for everyone, uh, just send me an email first, and I'll give you a, um, an email, or sorry, a, a mailing um, address for your checks. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, traditionally our AGM is a time when most people read, buy or renew their memberships. So I'm expecting a real flurry of activity here in the next few days. Could I ask a well, question, David? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so I think I've been paying for a membership now for three years and making a donation each time as well. Um, however, when I visited the site this time, prompted by the AGM email, which was yeah. good, um, I noticed that it doesn't actually have any button that um, basically says renew your membership. It gives you an opportunity to join. Um, and so I, in essence, joined again um, by submitting my email, etc. Is it possible to um, I don't know, just enhance the sense of belonging like you already belong. So you click the renew button and pay your $30 as opposed to uh, um, having to join again. Um, well, that's a very good question. And I, I don't have that, um, that technical savvy to provide an answer for you right now. But I, what I will say is that we will uh, look into that and uh, We'll try and make that improvement or some facsimile there. Great, thank you. Okay, and uh, David, um, we we um, our neighbors on uh, Horseshoe Lane. Yeah, so, I thought so. David. So um, I don't know. I can come down and speak with you if you like, or you can, uh, you know, if you're ever walking, you can drop by eleven sixty six, and uh, we can chat about that. Great, thank you, David. You're welcome. So I guess that's it for uh, for my contributions here. Uh, so Amanda will give us a little introduction for our speaker, Mark. Yes, uh, so hi everyone, my name is Amanda and I am the uh, recording secretary for the Board of Directors for Friends of Salmon River and 
I think I got the best job tonight, which is to introduce our uh, featured speaker. So Mark Boone is a licensed professional geoscientist and he has more than 30 years experience in the field of hydrogeology. Mark was employed in the consulting industry and managed projects related to groundwater supply, waste disposal, land development, uh, aggregate extraction and environmental contamination. And Mark became the first regional hydrogeologist at Quinty Conservation uh, under the Quinty Source Water Protection Program. He's filled various roles for the Conservation Authority uh, and he's also an appointed risk management official under the Clean Water Act uh, and a regulations officer under the Conservation Authorities Act. He's also held a water well contractor uh, and well technician license uh, with the Ontario Ministry of the Environment. And so just before I hand it over to Mark, I just wanted to remind everybody that if you have questions uh, for Mark during the presentation, if you can please add them to the chat box and we'll um, relay those questions to Mark at the end of the presentation. And if you have a more lengthy question or something that's maybe a bit more of a personal situation that won't necessarily apply to everybody, uh, you can reach out to Mark directly and his contact information will be uh, in his slides. So with that, uh, I'll pass it over to Mark. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me? It's all good? Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much for that introduction. I was looking through the participants to see whether there was another Mark Boone on the on the call here. <laughs> very, very good. So, um, yeah, I've put together a little slide presentation just to talk about groundwater in the Salmon River watershed. And I'm going to attempt to share my screen here so I can open that up. Um, I apologize to the people on the phone. So my pictures aren't nearly as uh, appealing or as attractive as the one Stephanie showed at the beginning. Awesome pictures. And I gotta say thank you to your whole group for the work, good work that you do. I think the Salmon River watershed is one of the jewels, definite jewels of the Quinney area. That's something I've been able to, I've never had the privilege of live, living in the Salmon River watershed, but I've enjoyed it for a long time. Growing up in Kingston, I had a friend or good friend that his family had a farm near Forest Mills. And I was able to go out there many times and enjoy exploring the Salmon River watershed swimming at the Forest Mills Conservation Area, Buttermilk Falls. And to, to this day still, uh, I get to pass that on to my kids when they're home. We often go up, uh, we've been up to the headwaters, Hungry Lake fishing. Uh, my daughter comes home and we've gone and enjoyed just watching the water at Buttermilk Falls and the Kingsford Conservation Area. Very relaxing place to go and something definitely worth protecting. So today, uh, usually, uh, it's a little bit different for me. Usually I'm standing up someplace and I have a presentation and a pointer and I get to point to things on the, on the screen. So what I've tried to do here is make my mouse bigger. So as I go through, uh, I'll use my mouse to point to things on the different slides. So what I wanna go over today is basically a groundwater 101 talk a little bit about groundwater in the Quinney watershed, what it is, where it comes from, water testing, things that you should be doing if you use a well for your water supply, uh, how you should be looking after your well and help you identify what is a good well and a bad well, septic systems, a little bit about how they work and the things that are important to consider. And at the end, just a quick blurb on wellhead protection areas, something that you can do in your own home. So we start off looking at the hydrologic cycle, trying to figure out where all this groundwater comes from. Well, the hydrologic cycle is driven by rain. A lot of people think the cycle is the rain falling to the ground surface, running over into local streams and rivers, where it evaporates back up into the clouds, condenses and falls again. But there's a really important component from the hydrologic cycle, and that's groundwater. So when it rains, some of the water infiltrates down to the soil and keeps going and it recharges our groundwater. Uh, the groundwater doesn't just sit there waiting for us to come and drill a well into it to use the water, it continues to flow. So the water flows downhill and discharges to our local streams and rivers, the Salmon River, and uh, 
then it evaporates again and goes back through the same cycle. So when, a lot of the work I've done in the source water protection project was looking at the water budget for the Quinney area. And it's quite amazing the numbers. Every year on an annual basis, we get about three feet of precipitation, that's snow and rainfall combined, that falls on the ground surface. However, when we look at evaporation and transpiration combined, that's evaporation off the lakes, transpiration from the plants and trees, two feet. So two thirds of that water is evapotranspired away. That only leaves one foot of water left over for recharging our groundwater and recharging our local streams and rivers. So uh, one of the things with evapotranspiration is it's driven strictly by temperature. So when we're talking about climate change and our future climates warming up, this is very concerning to me as a hydrogeologist of how much water we're going to have in the future because we can't control the temperature. The higher the temperature goes, the more water we're going to lose or is consumed by evapotranspiration. So what is groundwater in an aquifer? A lot of people think groundwater in an aquifer is something like an underground lake or, or river. Well, in reality, very rarely does groundwater occur in an underground lake or river. Groundwater is the water that fills the pores in between soil particles, or in the case of fractured rock, it's in the cracks of the rock. So when all those pore spaces are filled in the gravel or the rock, the, and the total area is saturated, the top of that is called the water table. So that's the saturated zone. And an aquifer is where there's enough spaces that permit the transmission of water through that formation to be usable. How does groundwater flow? Well, same as water on the land surface, water, groundwater flows downhill. So if you're looking at the topography uh, and the land is sloping towards a lake or a river, pretty good chance the groundwater is flowing in the same direction. This slide just shows the water table. You can see in the higher ground, it's higher. And as it falls towards, we can maybe call this uh, Beaver Lake or Salmon River. That is the direction of groundwater flow. What are the different types of aquifers? There's two main types of aquifers out there. And, and one is called an unconfined aquifer and the other is a confined. So unconfined means there is nothing that restricts the recharge of water from the ground surface. You can see in this uh, slide here, it's permeable sand and gravel. That water is falling straightly into this aquifer, nothing confining it. Down below, there's a deeper confined aquifer comprised of bedrock. It's protected by a layer of clay. So that aquifer is what we call confined. It's protected from activities at the ground surface. In the Quinney area, we generally don't have these confining layers. So you can pretty much take this top portion off and bring our bedrock up here with a little bit of soil cover. So our bedrock aquifers are unconfined and they are vulnerable to contamination from activities at the surface. Here we have a house with a septic system, recharges into the water table, fuel storage, burns, uh, chemical storage, all those activities can impact on our water quality. Uh, you might be asking, well, how does this guy really know about all the groundwater in the Quinney watershed? Where, where is he getting this information? Well, we participate in a program in partnership with the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, and that's called the Provincial Groundwater Monitoring Network. Here we have a map of the Quinney watershed, um, Salmon River going up through here. Uh, that red dot is Tamworth. This is a picture of one of our monitor wells. If you're out wandering behind the store in Tamworth any day, you might see a well with a green box and a solar panel. That well has a logger in it that measures a water level every hour, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, and it transmits the data via satellite in the sky directly to the computers at our office so we can get the water levels. Uh, that's the location right there of the well. They, these wells, we, we have a total of 29 of them in our watershed. Very fortunate to have that many and, and we're well informed on the fluctuations of the water table. I'll just show you the next slide here. Uh, this is a typical, well actually, this is this year of that well in Tamworth. This is the water levels. So down on the lower part of the screen here, 
I started that January and then I didn't quite make it to December because we're not there yet. But at the end, I just looked up the data at the end of last week and on the uh, Y axis or the left hand side, this is the water level. And I've tried to label the different seasons. So here you can see in the winter, the water level is fairly high. When the ground freezes, the recharge doesn't happen. In fact, that's almost like a little confining layer. So you can see last winter, I didn't think it was that cold, but it must have been enough frost in the ground in the Tamworth area for the water table to start falling. Then as the temperatures rose and what snow we had, which wasn't a lot last winter, melted and we got a bit of a spring freshet. So this is the highest time of year for groundwater. Then what happens is the water table continues to fall. And uh, this summer, uh, actually we're still in a low water condition. We're in a level one low water drought, but in the summertime we were in a level two drought, which is the second worst. Uh, the groundwater fell to that level. At the end of August, beginning of September, we did see some rainfall and that well did respond. It didn't come all the way back up, but it came up a bit. And then it, the rain dropped off, continued to fall. And now we're, we're rising again as the vegetation stops growing. Uh, less water consumed by evapotranspiration and more water goes into the ground. However, we still need more rain in order to recharge our groundwater. The other thing we can look at with these groundwater levels is the long-term trend. So this is the same well. I'm showing water levels since 2010. Uh, each bar here is one year all the way up to 2020. I've labeled the years that have been low water years. So you can see definitely how low the water actually drops in that well during drought seasons. So 2011, 2012, 2018, we had a little bit of a data gap here. Equipment's great as long as it's working, but it doesn't always work. Uh, but 2019 and 2020 were all level two droughts. 2016 was the big year where we had a uh, level three drought. First every year we declared a low water declaration. And you can kind of see the, the size of the gap here in the comparison to these other years that that was a, was a bad year. So what about water quality? Well, we know a little bit about groundwater and the groundwater quantity, but what about water quality? Well, Public Health Ontario in partnership with Queen's University has done a study looking at all of the water tests that are sent in to the public health laboratories. These are the the samples you take from your private well and have them analyzed for bacteria. They didn't have uh, locations, like specific locations of where these water samples came from, but they had uh, postal code addresses for different samples. So they looked at all the samples um, across Southern Ontario between 2008 and 2012 in excess of 100,000 samples and did an analysis of the ones that tested positive for E. coli. So those are the ones that had E. coli contamination in the water samples. And they ended up identifying three main clusters or significant clusters of areas where E. coli contamination existed. So we have this big cluster here, which covers a big chunk of the Quinney watershed, all of Prince Edward County, uh, part of Lennox and Addington, part of Hastings. I've added in uh, this little corner of stone mills just for reference points so you, you know where, where this cluster is located. Uh, the Niagara region also they identified significant and the Bruce Peninsula. So what's in common with these three areas is what I described earlier, very thin soil over fractured bedrock, highly vulnerable aquifer conditions. So they, it is a, a problem, you know, the things we do on the land surface can contaminate our groundwater. Um, I don't want to alarm anybody by this slide. So they are identifying areas of potential. But when we look at the total number of samples, we're looking at five to 6% of the samples tested positive for E. coli. So it's a fairly low number, not saying that, you know, you're going to have contaminated water. It's just meaning that, hey, yeah, we are at risk in this area. We need to be checking our water and doing what we can to protect it. Um, the second study that was done by Public Health Ontario in partnership with Queen's was to do something they call microbial source tracking. So basically what they did was they took some of the samples that tested positive for E. coli and did DNA analysis trying to determine what the source of the contamination was. 
Uh, and you're probably gonna be surprised to hear that the majority of the samples in our area here, the source of the contamination was human. So that would say the, the bacteria is coming from our septic systems and contaminating our groundwater. And as you're gonna see, I'm going to go through a few other slides on things that we can do to try to prevent that from happening by uh, looking at well construction, making sure our wells are properly constructed. We, we live in an area with a highly vulnerable aquifer, so we need to take extra precaution to protect our wells and also to have a look at our septic systems to make sure they're working properly. Um, not to belabor the point here, but uh, around the same time, the Ontario dairy farmers also did a study uh, looking at the quality of water being used to wash out uh, bulk milk tanks at dairy farms because there's a kind of a penalty associated with bacteria in the milk supply. So they, were, they had an interest in bacteriological quality of the groundwater. And lo and behold, uh, they have the bigger circles here. The, the smaller ones are the ones identified by Public Health Ontario, exact same three areas they identified. And a little bit higher percentage of uh, bacteria contamination, I think they were around 10% of the samples there came back with uh, bacteria in them. So what can you do? One of the main things you need to do is test your water. The local health unit recommends testing at least three times a year. It's a, it's a free service, so I highly recommend people go to the health unit, pick up a sample kit, follow the instructions on the uh, sample kit, they're pretty clear, uh, and return those samples and see what you can get back. One of the things I do stress, and I don't know if you can do, I was looking at my own kitchen tap here, some of these newer taps, it's hard to take their air aerator off, but you need to follow the procedure by taking aerators off, disinfecting the sample or the, the tap um, before you take your sample because you don't wanna test the cleanliness of your kitchen tap, you wanna test the cleanliness of the water. So there's a number of locations where you can pick up these sample kits. Uh, the Salmon River straddles two counties, so you can get it at the Kingston Frontenac Clinics and Addicton Public Health Unit, and I provided their website here. They have offices in Kingston, Napanee, Cloyne, and Sherbert Lake, and the lower portion of the salmon in the Hastings watershed or Hastings County area. Uh, Balvo would be the main location, but if perchance you're in any of these other areas, you could also go to North Hastings. Prince Edward County has one here in Picton, which is actually where I live, or, or Quinney West. Uh, so that was just talking about bacteriological quality. Some people are more interested in the chemical quality of their water. Generally speaking, the chemical quality of the groundwater in the Quinney area is pretty good. But sometimes there are things that show up. Uh, one of the main things to look for is nitrates which also comes from our septic systems and agricultural runoff. Uh, that's something the health unit doesn't do. And you can go to a private lab and get this tested. There is a lab in Kingston called Caduceon Environmental Labs. They're right on Dalton Avenue, close to the 401. We use them at Quinney Conservation, very good service there. There's a lab in, in Lakefield called SGS. They do the same service <clears throat> and another uh, source or an avenue for you to use is through the Ontario Groundwater Association. If you go to their website, ogwa.ca, they have packages available for private well owners that they can get their water tested for different chemical parameters. I just took some of the prices. Now this is a lot more than just nitrates that if you're interested in doing a chemical analysis of your water supply, uh, just contact them. They have an application form. They'll ship you the bottles you fill them up and send them back and they'll look after getting it analyzed and actually give you a little bit of interpretation as well. Uh, they do have a shipping fee of $50. So probably I'm gonna guess maybe a little bit more than if you use one of the local labs and take the sample there yourself. So if you have a bad sample, what do you do? Well, first thing, stop drinking the water. Not good to drink bacteriologically contaminated water. One of the things sometimes what can happen is you get a not representative sample. You might have test, uh, touched the lid or the top of the bottle resulting in some contamination. So what they recommend is, well, disinfecting your well, the health units, both the, uh, 
the websites that are provided for the Hastings and the Kingston health units, they have instructions on how to disinfect your well and retest it to make sure you actually do have a bad water sample. Uh, if it does come back bad again, look for the problem. Try to find out what went wrong and where the source of the contamination might be coming from. One of the things that uh, I'm going to talk about in a bit is well construction. Improper well construction can result in water quality problems. So it's important to make sure your well is properly constructed. Your septic systems are the obvious source on your residential lots that you need to make sure they're operating properly. Uh, last resort, uh, I don't recommend going straight to water treatment equipment, but it is definitely a good idea to have water treatment just to give you a little bit extra protection of your groundwater quality. Uh, it's not meant to replace well uh, having proper well construction or making sure your septic system is operating properly, but definitely a good idea to have water treatment. And then lastly, if you do have an offsite problem, you've done everything you can at your own property and you can't rectify the problem and you think it might be something coming offsite, then please call the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks in Kingston or Belleville. Uh, that is their job to investigate offsite water quality contamination. So those are things that outside of your control that anything you can't prevent from doing something on your own property. Well construction. Uh, just a quick little video here from the bad well at Walkerton. It's called well number five. This is the famous well that people drank water from and, and died. Um, after Walkerton happened, they, what they did was they put a camera down the well and pumped the water out trying to figure out what was going on with this well. So at the top left-hand corner here, you can see the water looks pretty clear. And then as you move to the right, down to the lower left, and then again to the right, you'll see how the water gets cloudier. What happened here when they pumped the water, they pumped it out down the hill. And as they pump more water, that shallow water was recharging into this well, bringing with it dirt. So this well was not constructed properly. It didn't meet today's code for proper depth of casing in their well. So there was, uh, you know, a lot of problems happen with Walkerton, but here is one that could have been easily prevented by having a well that at least met today's standards for well construction. So dug wells, those are the large diameter wells. They're fairly shallow in nature. They're usually dug with a, with a backhoe and a concrete well tile or casing is put in. Uh, these are examples of some bad dug wells. Here we have an old rock lined well, which they truly are works of art. There was tremendous amount of effort put into making these wells, but they don't keep out shallow uh, water that could be contaminated. Definitely gonna be a water quality problem here. Uh, on the left or the right hand side here, we have a newer properly constructed, or no, improperly constructed dug well that's made of concrete well tiles, but you can see in the seams, the water running down the sides. So that too is letting shallow water into this well, which could bring contamination with it. man talking. <laughs> and here's uh, at the bottom here, uh, another dug well with the well tile flush with brown surface. That's not going to keep out any shallow runoff from running down, right down through the lid, bringing with it possible contamination. A properly constructed dug well is one here where we see in the lower left, it's extended at least 40 centimeters above ground surface, preferably with a solid lid without the, the little hatch and has properly sealed well tiles all the way down and at least eight feet of clay material sealing around the outside of the well. This is very important to have a good seal, have the top up above ground surface and have the ground sloped away from the top of the well so surface water doesn't collect and enter into the shallow well. Oh, how about drill wells? A, people, a lot of people think that having a drill well solves all the problems, but there, were, there are still a lot of wells out there that are drilled that have problems. Uh, one of the biggest ones that I see a lot are well pits. So it's basically a large diameter concrete tile like a dug well, but it has a drilled well inside. What happens is the water accumulates in this well pit and then goes down inside your deep drilled well. So thereby short circuiting any protection that the ground would provide. Hmm. Another one 
that's quite common for a period of time. A lot of people were burying wells. They didn't like looking at the well casing standing above grade. So here is a nice manicured lawn. The well is someplace underneath that lawn. Another no-no because shallow groundwater can seep into that well, thereby preventing any treatment by filtering it down through the ground. And then uh, if you, you're, you're looking at your drill well and you see any holes around the outside of the casing, that means the seal around the outside of that casing is, is uh, failed. And shallow water can run down the side of the casing into your deeper groundwater, giving you contamination. No, 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 eyes are. So oh. here's the diagram of a properly constructed drilled well. Same thing, casing at least 40 centimeters above grade. Uh, the casing needs to be at least 20 feet in order to provide the proper amount of protection. That's the today's code and a proper cap on top of the well, which I think I have in my next slide here, yes. Um, so the old standard caps were one piece caps that fit on top of the well and just tightened down. Here's what happens with a lot of these caps when you take them off. I don't know if you've ever seen underneath, you got earwigs, insects, cocoons, hornet's nests, all those things can give you elevated bacteria in your water. Would you want to brush your teeth with water out of this well? Ugh. So today's proper cap is a two-piece cap, and it's called a vermin-proof well cap. They uh, have two pieces. One fits down over top of the well, and then there's a rubber seal that fits between it and the upper piece. And when it's tightened down, it creates a seal that prevents any insects from getting into your well cap. Very easy fix. It still is something that you need to have a licensed water well contractor help you with because the electrical lines that go down to the pump need to be cut and then spliced. But definitely recommend if you have a drill well without a proper well cap that you get an upgrade done with a, a vermin proof well cap. Uh, the well pits that I showed earlier, this is the example of a typical well pit with a drill well in the bottom. Here's the water level up above that causing infiltration into the well. A well contractor can come and upgrade that. There are uh, extensions they can put on to extend it up above grade, or there's also couplers that can be slid on. Again, something that needs to be done by a licensed contractor, but if you have a well pit, I highly recommend it you get rid of it uh, to protect your own water quality. Old dug wells, uh, there's thousands of these across the province. And I showed earlier that we're vulnerable to groundwater contamination in this area. These old wells, if they're forgotten about and not properly sealed, they're conduits into the aquifer. These need to be sealed up and it has to be done by a licensed contractor to do it properly. So you may be doing everything properly on your own property by upgrading your own well and making sure your septic system is functioning properly. But if you have one of these nearby, uh, it's not good just to say, well, we're not drinking the water from it, so we don't have to worry about it. Groundwater moves, and this can result in contamination of your water supply. If you're looking for information about well records, um, you can go to the Ministry of Environment website, and I have it here listed as well as at the end of the slide deck, uh, where you can go on there. There's a map, and you zoom into your area and click on the blue dots, and a well record will pop up. So you can, if there is a well record for your property, you can find it. The newer wells are, the locations are not bad since 2002, but some of the older well records, the, uh, they use little sketch maps to identify locations. So they're, they're not that reliable, but it will give you good information about groundwater in your area. If you can find your own well record, it'll give you the depth of casing, the flow, Water quality, definitely a good resource. I, I use this tool on a regular basis to help people out when they're wondering about purchasing a property, what the groundwater conditions are like. Oh, septic systems. So uh, a septic system is basically a tank which is designed to remove the solids and then a network of pipes which the liquids flow into and filter down through the soil. So they are basically designed to recharge the groundwater, unfortunately. So anything that you don't want to have in your groundwater, don't flush down your septic tank. In this little diagram, you can see we have a well here. And I mentioned that water flows downhill earlier in my presentation. 
when you turn the pump on in your well, you, you cause the water table to drop near your well and the water table or anything near the well could possibly flow towards your well. So when it comes to your septic system, you wanna make sure your septic is as far away from your well as you can get it on your property, as well as far away from your neighbor's wells. So it's important to make sure your septic system is properly maintained by pumping out the tanks, getting the solids removed so that it's getting proper treatment. Uh, there's also, it's actually not new anymore because all new septic systems have a filter which goes on the outlet. But if you don't, if you have an older system that doesn't have a filter on the outlet, I recommend you get one installed when you have somebody coming in to pump out your tank. What this filter does is it keeps the solids in the tank as opposed to flowing out into your tile bed and plugging up the, the pipes. And when the pipes plug up, what happens is the effluent will break out to the surface and it doesn't get proper treatment. It could run off the ground surface into the streams and rivers or into somebody's well. Uh, the soil-based treatment systems, here's a diagram or a cross section of a septic system with the pipes. And if you live in an area with a high water table or shallow bedrock, such as a lot of the Quinney region, and you don't see one of those raised mounds out in your yard, there's a chance that you may not have a properly constructed system. So what happens in this case, uh, there isn't enough soil here to treat the effluent and it ends up backing up and, and doesn't get proper treatment. This is what we call groundwater mounting. There needs to be three feet of soil below these trenches uh, above bedrock and above the water table in order to receive proper treatment of the septic effluent. And this is just a diagram showing uh, a proper system with proper treatment. We can see the, the effluent coming out of the pipes, it gets treated and then filters off in the direction of, of groundwater movement. Uh, in addition to just the conventional soil based systems where there's a tank and a tile bed, there are numerous other systems out there that people can use. Uh, this is one that's uh, a fiberglass shell or two fiberglass shells full of a peat moss. It gives what we call tertiary quality effluent. It's a higher quality effluent than the conventional septic tank tile bed. It helps protect groundwater, but it also protects surface water. If you live on a small lot or near a lake or a river, I highly recommend you look at one of these alternative systems. This is actually the system that we have installed at our office in Belleville. There are two units here, mainly because of the size of our office. A normal residence would require one of these green shells. Uh, we've had that system for 15 years. I'd, yeah, about 15 years. And uh, it's been working great. They, we do get an annual inspection done by the manufacturer. And they said the peat moss is good and it doesn't need to be replaced. So. So all is good and we keep moving. Another one out there is a Waterloo biofilter. Same sort of concept as the peat moss unit, only it uses a different media. It's basically a foam cube and it gives really good high quality effluent. The uh, same uh, type of application requires some, some maintenance by a manufacturer's representative to come along and make sure everything's working. They're saying, I don't know how long uh, they last, but they're saying 20 years before the foam cubes need to be cleaned. And uh, I'd like to follow up on one that's been in that long just to find out if the foam cubes had to have been taken out and cleaned. But again, very high quality effluent to help protect your groundwater and nearby surface water. Okay, wellhead protection areas. We've talked about well construction, water testing and septic systems, but what can you do on your own property? Those are all things that are good to do. What you should be doing, here we have a little diagram of a well and a house and the different activities. We have a garden, pesticides, fruit trees, is establish a radius. I recommend at least 30 meters, the bigger the better, where you look at different activities that are going on in that well head protection area. So here, down here, we have the little pictures of things that shouldn't be done. Uh, don't fuel up your lawnmower near your well. Any spills will infiltrate into the ground and could contaminate your well. Don't tie your pets to a well or have a, a dog run near it because obviously any of the contamination on the surface could give you high counts of bacteria. 
uh, don't have chicken uh, coops or any sort of livestock near your well. Fuel storage is another big one. Home heating oil tanks that are outside often do spring leaks and they can give you serious water quality problems with contamination and gardens. Keep your gardens away from your wells, if you're, especially if you're going to apply fertilizers. I mentioned earlier in the presentation that water treatment equipment is a last resort, but still a good idea to install an ultraviolet light, which will help uh, sterilize the water, any bacteria that could be in it. I do recommend that a sediment filter be put ahead of the ultraviolet light because what can happen is if dirty water gets through, uh, the bacteria shield themselves on the soil particles or the dirt and the ultraviolet light won't do its job. Uh, one thing to consider here is that ultraviolet lights do need maintenance. It's not a simple thing as just putting them in and walking away. The, the bulbs inside these UV lights do need to be changed. The manufacturer has recommendations, but at least once a year, those bulbs need to be changed. So that's uh, the end here. Thank you very much. And I just want to remind you that groundwater protection starts at home with you and what you do on your property can affect your neighbors. I've provided a, a list of different websites where you can go to to get more information. There's the one about the well records if you want to try to find out information about the well on your property. I put the two health units here for contacting them about getting water sample test kits as well as for procedures for disinfecting your well. And another one you might be interested in, also the Ministry of Environment has a, a website where you can go and find a licensed water well contractor. So any work you get done on your well needs to be done by a licensed water well contractor. Thanks very much for, for listening to my, my talk here. And thank you again for the good work that you guys do on the, on the Salmon River watershed. Mark, I do have a couple of <clears throat> a couple of questions for you. Sure. That people have yeah, that people have entered in the chat box. So our first one is great presentation, very informative. What can we do to support Quinty Conservation against the current government's proposal to remove your ability to make expert comments on proposed development? Uh, the best thing you can do right now is lobby the government. So Ontario Nature actually has made it quite easy for, and I should have included that here on my, my last page to ask people to, to go on to the Ontario Nature website. They've actually written a letter and by putting in your postal code, it will send that letter to your local MPP as well as the Minister of Natural Resources, the Ministry of Environment as well. So best thing you can do is lobby the provincial government right now not to, to make those changes to um, the Conservation Authorities Act. They actually call it repealing section six of bill 229. So section six deals all uh, with conservation authorities and changing the act, which basically is taking away some of our powers, which are already pretty limited in uh, how we comment on land development applications. So, you know, my thoughts is I think we need more, not, not less. But th thank you very much for that comment. I, I appreciate it. Okay, we have one more question, which is, is groundwater ever under enough pressure to flow uphill? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there is. And actually I, I mentioned the two types of aquifers, confined and unconfined. And I said that generally speaking, we pretty much all have unconfined aquifers in this area because uh, of shallow soil over fractured bedrock. However, I have seen uh, quite a few flowing wells and there are the, sometimes the limestone or even other uh, rock can be confining in itself when the fracture densities get so low that there is confining layers. And I see Stephanie there nodding. I, I believe she has a well on one of our properties that is a flowing well. And uh, yeah, she, she probably knows a lot more about that than me because I think she's doing her uh, research on, on that particular well. But definitely, yeah, water can flow uphill. Um, the other situation is uh, if there are, say, confining layers where water's coming down and those layers slope uphill, 
as opposed to downhill, there, there could be a case of that, but very, very rare. And we have another question here. If you notice leaking or seeping along seams in your newly constructed dug well, what should you do? I would, if you know who installed that well, I would call them to come back and have a look at it. Uh, if they won't, um, it's difficult and the decision is on, on you to yourself call a water well contractor to come in and, and have it fixed. It's, it could mean digging around the well and purging all the seams. It's not the easiest to get inside, but definitely they would dig down around the outside of the well tiles and seal them up. I have seen it myself on newly constructed wells that they weren't installed properly. There is a, a recourse, it's kind of a last resort. Usually you wanna to try to work with your contractor first, but there is recourse through the Ministry of Environment. Uh, they do have inspectors that come out and will inspect the well, make sure it's constructed as per Ontario Regulation 903. That's the regulation that governs well construction and uh, the action could be taken. If it is something new, if it's old, it, it'll be difficult to do, but uh, definitely I, I would get that looked at by a licensed water well contractor to get it fixed up. The next question is, does a hydrogen peroxide system work as well as an ultraviolet light? Yeah, I'm not a water treatment expert, but yes, I would say it does if it's properly operated. Um, maybe not as easy as an ultraviolet light in that there's chemicals that need to be added and the dosing has to be at the right amount. So there might be something if you're not comfortable operating that you have a service contractor come in and help you operate it, make sure it's maintained. Um, but, but yeah, definitely hydrogen peroxide, chlorine, they're both disinfectant, uh, do a great job. It's just, it's just adding chemicals to your water. I, I live here on municipal water and I have to drink the chlorine and I really don't like it, but uh, it's better to have safe water than, than not. And related to that question, is a reverse osmosis system with a hydrogen peroxide system adequate? Okay, they had the reverse osmosis. Uh, what it does is remove the chemical content. So any of the minerals that are in the water, it'll basically strip those out and you'll have pure H2O. So maybe not, doesn't work so well with disinfection. So the hydrogen peroxide works great for the disinfection, but the reverse osmosis is to remove any of the, the mineral content of the water. Um, if you, I guess that that's going to give you the best quality drinking water you could get if you like that type of water. There's basically no, no mineral, no anything in it. It's, it's pure H2O. I, I find uh, just my own preference. Uh, I like a little bit of mineral taste in the water rather than the pure H2O. But everybody has their own preference on, on what they like to drink. It definitely could help with, um, I mentioned about nitrates in the groundwater. If there were nitrates in your water, they would help remove those. So you're, you're going to have a safe water supply for sure. And it looks like our last question, what does it cost to de decommission an old dug well? That is a very good question. So it depends a lot on the depth and the diameter of the well. We've, uh, at Quinney Conservation, we have a lot of different properties and we've stumbled across a lot of these old wells. And because we're, we're practicing or, or telling people that they need to decommission their wells, we, we try to clean up our own shop first. And we've had some dug wells that have cost us in the neighborhood of $1,500. Uh, 2000, I guess would be at the, at the high level, which when it's filling in a hole in the ground, you, you got to think, wow, that's a lot of money, but there is a complicated procedure where you need to have a contractor come in and do it. They, they have to pump out the well, uh, disinfect it. And then they put in a clean, uh, soil material up to a certain depth. And then there's a layer of, um, a material that they call bentonite that goes in. And then the well tile or any casing has to be removed down to a depth of six feet. So it requires a backhoe to come in and, and do that. And then the whole well has to be backfilled in. So it is a, a fairly detailed process to, to follow. So 
not cheap, but uh, call a licensed contractor. There, there's plenty of good contractors in the Napanee area and that they could give you a quote on, on doing that work. That is all the questions I have in the chat box. Is there anybody we missed um, or any questions that I missed in the audience? Okay, in that case, um, I'm gonna go over, send this over to Herb to thank Mark. Thank you. Mark, uh, when we first moved out here to the country, uh, we were drinking lake water and after a few bouts of beaver fever, Susan Moore sent me a get well soon card. <laughs> so we did. And we never look back, of course. Uh, but seriously, Mark, thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely blown away by how much I've learned from you this evening. And I'm sure everybody else in the audience uh, feels, feels the same way. Uh, we've learned so much about stuff that we tend to just take for granted. You know, I mean, there's that well out there and we really don't pay much attention to it. Uh, it's a great comfort to know that you and your staff are out there uh, doing the research, being vigilant, dealing with issues that most of us are blissfully unaware of. Uh, thank you for giving us a much better understanding of the complexities of uh, well water and aquifers and groundwater and all the rest of it. Uh, and uh, an appreciation of our water supply and all the support systems that are out there that, uh, that keep us healthy. Uh, thank you for everything that you do and thank you for everything that you've taught us tonight. Have a good oh, night. Very nice, thank you very much. And you guys too, a big thanks back to you for what you do in the Salmon River watershed. You're doing great work. Well, Mark, I'm actually receiving all kinds of comments in the chat box that are all saying, excellent talk. I learned so much. I guess we're just going to have to have you back again sometime because <laughs> everybody's really thrilled with all the, um, well, the, just the good, useful material. Um, you know, obviously we can't emphasize enough to people to, um, you know, uh, tread really carefully uh, out there in your yard in terms of being really careful with your well and your septic and making sure that you get your water tested regularly. Yeah, thanks. That's great, yeah. One thing I could say is test your water. And if you have a problem, look for the what the source might be. Um, um, so I can start, we've got one last slide uh, for the evening. So I'll just switch over to sharing. Thanks very much for that, Mark. I always love a talk on groundwater. Um, so these are some of the resources that we're going to send everybody who's been part of the presentation tonight. So as long as we have your email address, we are going to send you two different uh, PDFs of two different booklets, the Conservation Ontario Private Wells book and the Well Aware booklet, both really excellent outlines of what you can do to um, take care of your water supply, your well and your septic. We will also send you the AGM slides and a link to tonight's recording so you can watch it again or share with other people. And we'll also email you the president's report so that you have that. If anyone does have general questions or comments about tonight, please go ahead and e email me, susan at moorepartners.ca. So I'm almost sad to say that's the end of the AGM. <laughs> I think it's been really, really kind of fun and um, so glad to have uh, such a good audience with us. So thank you so much for attending and um, we'll see you next year if we get to have a real live AGM or another Zoom AGM. But I think our first one worked out fairly well. What we actually want to do at this point is um, it, it, this is the, um, of course, the end of the meeting. Um, after other people sign off, our board is going to, uh, the board of directors is just gonna stay on for a few minutes to, to do a quick little wrap up. So anybody in the board, if you could just hang on to the screen for a couple of minutes, uh, that would be great. And um, otherwise, unless anybody has any last minute questions, 
we shall say good evening to you.